Welcome back to Unsolved No More. Today I want to talk a bit about what was in the news regarding Brian Koberger's alibi. Now, any of you that have followed my channel or have gone back and watched my videos, you will see that I predicted this and I'm not a psychic and I do not uh, play the stock market because I don't always have proper uh, guesses. But when you know what you're talking about, it's not always a guess. It's deductions, okay? It's, it, it applies in criminal proceedings just like it does in, in, in life. If you take statistics and you back that with experience, um, it's very easy to deduce what's going to happen. So a couple videos back, I had said that they were going to introduce an alibi for Koberger because they have to explain away why it's his car, why it's his phone pinging near the residence all these times, right? They have to, defense has to come up with that. Now, listen, let me preface this by saying I'm not an attorney. I never want to be an attorney. Um, and, but I respect attorneys, most of them. They have got to come up with a reason as to why Koberger is there, essentially. Not in the house, in the area, based off of cell phone pings, based off his car being seen outside. Now, sure, they could say it wasn't his car, right? They could essentially say that. But I think they've given in to the fact that, okay, they are going to be able to prove that it's his car based on the cell phone pings and the car being seen there as, as well. I don't know if that's a smart move, but I'm not an attorney. I think I would argue that it's not my car, not my client's car. But like I said in the previous video, they're try they have to try to explain this away. So the most logical explanation, I think I gave this analogy or explanation in the previous video, and I'm, it might be labeled alibi. If I can find it, I've done a lot of Idaho videos, but I'll link it at the end so you can go back and say, hey, well, he wasn't full of shit. He actually knew what he was talking about. That's the whole goal is to not be full of shit and be able to explain and talk intelligently about the topic at hand. So you have to be able to explain why my car and my cell phone pings are happening around that house. So I said, let's say he's going to come up with the excuse, hey, yes, that was me, I was in the area, but I was playing cards at a nearby house that night because every uh, Thursday night, that's when we go and play cards. I gave that as, a, as a, an analogy or an excuse um, reasoning of what the defense could say. But I acknowledge that that is hard because you have to get somebody to cooperate that information, right? Somebody at that card game would have to say, yes, Brian was here every Thursday. Well, it's not true, right? So unless somebody was to lie for him, it's not going to happen. But if he says, hey, I was by myself, I like to drive late at night, that's my alibi. Well, that is smart because I think that when they explain this to the jury, they're going to say, hey, look at Brian Koberger's uh, past, look at his his character, and what do you see? A loner. And everything that he's done in life matches that. 
So wouldn't it stand to reason that he would go by himself? Right? I mean, so th it's not that far-fetched. It's what the jury can comprehend. Right? So, yeah, I mean, I, I see what they're doing. It's smart uh, legal strategy, I guess. But there, there's more to come, you know. They're just chipping away. And again, I'm not an attorney. And, you know, I like to stay in my lane. But I know a little bit about attorneys. I've dealt with them my whole 20-year career or whatever. And uh, I've seen how they work. And I can take guesses, I guess, educated guesses at what they're going to do like I did with this alibi defense. So when it came out and I read it today, I was not surprised. I was like, yeah, that's what I said he was going to do. So uh, it's just you have to be able to look at things and say, why? Okay, why is very important as to to make things make sense, okay? Now, you can't make sense of this brutal quadruple homicide. You know, most people can't make sense of it. But, but in the person that did its mind, it's justified for whatever reason. Whether it's, you know, sexually motivated, fantasy-driven homicide, or if it's greed, uh, whether it's revenge, whatever it is. I've talked enough about what I believe it is, and I'm not going to get into that right now. But if you want to know, go back and look at the Idaho playlist and, and see for yourself. But it has to make sense to them, not anybody else. So then when there is an arrest, all that has to be conveyed now to the attorneys and the defense. And they have to now try to make sense of not whether your client's innocent or guilty, but how can we defend him to the best of our abilities? It's got to be a, it, almost like a moral dilemma inside a defense attorney. Now, I had a defense attorney one time that I couldn't stand. He had me on the, on the stand for it. Couldn't stand, and he had me on the stand for a couple hours on a traffic stop of a star basketball player where I seized uh, some marijuana and a couple guns. And when I got done, I won, of course. But when I got done, I realized he was the best defense attorney that I ever faced. He turned a mere traffic stop that obviously turned into a felony possession of, of weapons into an all-day trial where he just eviscerated me on the stand. Not character-wise so much, but meticulous details in the arrest affidavit that I had done. An example would be, you know, of course they get all the discovery. It means they get all the police reports and stuff. So in my police report, I wrote that I pulled him over because he had an expired um, registration sticker on his license plate. But in my affidavit of probable cause, I wrote that he was missing, I think, the sticker, not that it was expired. Um, and he honed in on that. And the reason being is it was missing but I radioed county, they don't know that the sticker isn't on there, right? So when you radio the police dispatch, they said it was expired. So technically I was right on both. It was missing and it was expired, but he doesn't know that either when he's reviewing it. And he just hones in on those mistakes. And that's why I always say it's very, very important to be meticulous in what you do. He almost won that case and got his client, who was obviously guilty, off on those little technicalities. Because then when he starts hammering me on it, well, which one is it, detective? 
is it expired or didn't he have one? And here you say this. And but it, oh, so it's true in the police report and not in the affidavit of probable cause where you swore in front of a judge, didn't you swear in you know in front of a judge that all this was true uh belief to correct your knowledge? And it, yeah, yeah. So he, he's getting you flustered when it's kind of like an innocent mistake, but there are no innocent mistakes when it comes to the law. You know what I mean? You have to be meticulous. So that defense attorney who then when we went out for for recess or break or whatever, and he told me, hey, don't take this personally. And I said, bullshit, I take it personally and this and that. And uh, I did not like him. Fast forward about five years, uh, he becomes district attorney and he hires me as one of his detectives because we had a mutual respect for each other. And I think of that moral dilemma, you know, because he was a defense attorney. He was in charge of getting people off and he did. But then when he became district attorney, he was putting guys away left and right. And let me tell you, he was tough, you know, so I don't know what that's like. I'd like to talk to him a little bit more about that, I guess, to get his inside feelings. I'm sure I did at the time. I'd worked for him for, I think, eight years and he was... The best boss that I ever had and uh, he was the best lawyer that I ever saw and now he's a judge so uh, you know it's the way things work but it those were my dealings with defense attorneys and prosecutors and be able you know when we would have a homicide case I'd be sitting across the table from the district attorney and we would be going over those meticulous facts because hey they're going to bring up this. How do we combat that? Okay. I learned that at least the good attorneys will never ask a question of somebody on the stand that they don't already know the answer that they're going to give. And based upon that answer, okay, if they say this, we're going to go this line of questioning. If they say this, we're going to go that. They're never caught off guard. At least good attorneys. Now, I know nothing about Koberger's attorneys, but what they're doing so far that I've noticed, it's normal. It's standard procedure and it's easy to figure out. Now, there are some cases that drop bombshells that you're just like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. Casey Anthony, when she went to trial, okay? And the I believe it was the opening statement, Jose, Jose Baez, who, mm, he's one of those attorneys that seem at least from the outside and what I've heard, sleazy. But I never want to make that uh, assertion because I never met the person. And I reserve all judgment pretty much until I look a person in the eyes and shake their hand and get to know them a little bit. Then, you know, or if they've done something to me, okay, well then I, I know, you know, what, how I feel about you. But somebody that I've never met never had any interaction with I don't like to say that they're bad people but I'll say from the outside Jose Baez looked a little slimy but he dropped the bombshell right hey Casey Anthony didn't kill a kid father found or drowned in the pool and and everyone whoa nobody expected that so there are bombshells and I guarantee the prosecution then was scrambling okay how do we we weren't expecting that answer, so how do we combat that? It's just a game. You know, I, I feel sometimes that that's all it is. The court system is just, no, it's not a joke. It's just, uh, it's, it gets away from the personal side of it, where it's just all business, backroom deals. You know, why does this guy plead out? to five years for a homicide and then this guy he gets sentenced to death oh wait he's poor and doesn't have any money this guy was drunk driving on wall street he's a millionaire and he can buy his way out you know it doesn't it doesn't make sense and it's the way the justice system is sometimes you know i speak of a guy that i that i know and i investigated he murdered a 10 year old girl got sentenced to 10 to 20 years did 10 years and got out 
and it was a, a strangulation, a cold-blooded murder of a child. He did 10 years. He got out and living his life. But yet, you know, you have somebody that got into a bar fight and was drunk, worked a good job, construction during the day, just went out to play at night. Some guy in him ripped off. He punches him. Guy goes down, hits his head, and dies. And he he's in jail for, let's say, 20, 30 years. Maybe because, you know, there's enhancements. He had a gun on him. He didn't pull the gun, but he was, he was a felon not to possess. Whatever it is. And then you look at those two cases side by side and say, hey, that's not justice. You know, it doesn't make sense. This guy wasn't out looking for trouble. He stopped to have a beer. Got into a fight. Could have happened to me. You have this guy who intentionally strangled a 10-year-old child and left her in a cornfield. You know, and he does 10 years and he gets to walk away. It just ain't fair. So that's the court system. So expect to see a lot more from the Koberger camp. The prosecution, I think, is going to continue to do what they're doing, which is stay tight-lipped, keep their evidence in-house the much as much as they can, some things are going to be leaked, right? That's just the way, the nature of things. Can't keep everything in because you have a multitude of people that see them. For instance, you file a search warrant. That search warrant doesn't just, it isn't between you, you know, the police officer, the detective, and the district attorney that's swearing to it. It goes to the judge. Do you think the judge is going to make those copies himself? No. He has secretaries. Secretaries make the copies. They file it. Those secretaries then go to lunch with friends from the prothonotary's office, and they talk and gab. Well, guess Well, don't tell anybody. I won't. Well, then that prothonotary office worker goes home and tells her husband and says, don't tell anybody, and then that worker goes to work the next day, and it spreads. That's how it works. So leaks happen. But the prosecution seems to be in a, to be doing a pretty good job of keeping things uh, in house. The defense they will leak things every now and again on purpose in order to get public view to shine a a, a positive light on their client and not negative. Good attorneys anyhow will do that. But some things like this alibi is just procedural. It's paperwork. It's filed, and then it's public. Um, it's not necessarily to gain sympathy on his end. It does nothing. This alibi is something that is expected, should have been expected, and he did exactly what I thought that they would do. So that's it. No bombshells here. Just uh, got some questions on that. People sent me some emails wanted me to speak on it so i am i'm trying not to do so much like these type of short videos i'm trying to stick to the deep dives and because of that i'm not going to be releasing as many videos as i normally do so new show coming out exit unsolved again small town cases uh, boots on the ground going there talking to family members and we've got a bunch lined up. So like I said in that, in that video, this Exit Unsolved video, when I was explaining to people what it is, I said if you're a family or friend of a cold case and you want to be involved, get a hold of me. Um, and we'll, we'll make it happen for the new show. That's it for Idaho. Thanks for listening. Hey, Maine's out. Bye.